you've ever watched one of those uh, kind of campy horror movies, then you know that the monster is always scariest before you actually see it. And for one woman, that principle extended into the interior of her home. Uh, this happened just last month up in Beaverton, Oregon. Washington County Sheriff's Office responded to a 911 call from a woman who reported hearing a burglar locked in her bathroom. She had come home and she heard this. And so uh, she saw shadows shifting under the door. And so finally the officers arrived on the scene and they too could hear this noise and see this persistent rustling behind the door. And, and uh, so after issuing several commands for this intruder to come out, they called for the canine unit to come, uh, the dog to come for backup. And so they got ready and they finally kicked the door open with their guns drawn. They released the dog into the bathroom to encounter the suspect an automated robot vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and so the, the sheriff's office reported this. They said, we entered the bathroom and saw a very, very thorough vacuuming job being done by a Roomba vacuum cleaner. <laughs> sheriff's deputy Brian Rogers reported. Uh, and then they continued on. They said the suspect was not taken into custody. <laughs> However, it's likely to be sentenced to several months of continuing uh, domestic servitude. So <laughs> I thought that was a fun story uh, just in our backyard, not very far away. But have you, do you know that in the eyes of God, the things that we're afraid of are often just insignificant? You know, fears don't just make us scared. They can inhibit us from living out our calling. In Scripture, God commands us not to be afraid because nothing exists outside of God's control and God's enemies are impotent in comparison to him. And yet, when the storms of life assail us, why is it that our go-to emotion so often is fear? Why is it that the emotion of fear often overtakes clear thinking, and sound reasoning. Well, I think, I believe, it's because our faith is out of balance. When we walk in fear, our faith becomes shaky. And faith is such an integral part of our Christian life. In Hebrews 11, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So in other words, faith is an absolute essential of our spiritual life. In fact, God has woven faith not just into our spiritual life, but into the, the world that we live in. And it's impossible to live without faith. For instance, as I stood in the back of the auditorium today, as you all came in before the service, I watched very carefully, and I, I did not observe any one of you as you came into the room, examining either the pew or the chair that you were sitting in. You came in, and you just automatically committed yourself by faith to sit down, just assuming that it would hold you. Here's another example. Many of you today got here by car. You slid into that vehicle, you put the key into the ignition or you pushed the button and started the car and away you went. A lot of us don't have a clue to, go to, to know what goes on behind the scenes. We can't explain the process. We just drive that car and we trust it to get us where we need to go. You see, faith is woven into the system of things. In our text today, in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35, in this text, Jesus clearly illustrates the collision of faith and fear. And so I want to take a look at this text today to see what we can do to overcome this shaky faith that we so often experience. The first thing that I want you to see is in verse 35, as, we, as the story begins, it, it says, on that day. And I want to just stop right there and say, okay, What's, what's going on here? 
on that day. That forces us to look back into chapter 4 a little further. What day? Well, it's the day, the day that they heard the lectures on faith from the world's greatest teacher. You see, Jesus had spent an entire day teaching the crowds, often using parables. The crowds were so large, they were pressing in on Jesus, so big, they were so eager to hear him, to see him, that Jesus had to get into a boat and be pushed offshore a little ways, an anchor, so that he could speak to the crowds on the shore before him. Now, Later in that day, after all of that teaching took place, Jesus took his disciples, those closest to him, took them aside, and he explained to them the meaning of many of the parables that he had used to teach the crowds. You see, they had experienced the lectures on faith. They had heard them. But you see, we don't really learn faith by a lecture. We learn it by life. And so that's why what happens next happens. So let's pick it up in verse 35. On that day, when evening came, Jesus said to them, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now let's just stop there for a moment. Who said that? Do you not care that we're perishing? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't the preacher. It wasn't the lecturer on faith. It, it was a group of professional fishermen. Many of these guys in that boat on that night had spent their whole lives on that lake. They were experienced. They knew exactly how these storms came up. You see, the Sea of Galilee is 690 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by hills and mountains with narrow, gorged valleys that act as wind tunnels. And so when the winds come and they blow and they come through those valleys and down onto that lake surface, it creates this tremendous draft. And in a matter of moments, of minutes, you can move from smooth sailing to the most serious storm you've ever seen. Now, many of those guys in that boat had experienced this many times. But perhaps they had never seen a storm like this storm. As far as they were concerned, this was the end. Things were desperate. Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? And in verse 39, Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down. And the sea became perfectly calm. Now, if you've ever been on a boat in the open ocean when the weather was not good, when the wind was blowing, and then if you've ever experienced the wind stop, one thing that you'll see is that the waves don't stop. Even after the storm calms down, the waves will continue. The big waves. Sometimes for hours, sometimes for days after a storm. And so here we see a, a twofold miracle. Not only does the wind stop, but the waves stop. And then in verse 40, Jesus says to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Now, in the, the original language that this story was written in in the Bible, the Greek language, they wanted, when they wanted to emphasize a word, they would take it out of the normal word order and they would bring that word up to the front of the sentence. It's kind of like taking a red marker and underlining a word four or five times just to really, okay, this is the word I want to emphasize. And that's what happens right here in this verse. And so Jesus basically says, how is it that you, 
You of all people are afraid. How is it that you are afraid? Who's he talking to? He's talking to the guys that had just heard the lectures on faith. These were the guys who had heard the Lord say, he who has ears, let him hear. It's like they took the final exam and they came up with a big fat F. And that F wasn't for faith. They flunked. Do you still have no faith? Jesus asked them. And in verse 41, they became very much afraid And they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I wonder if we can kind of empathize with the disciples a little bit. You know, how is it that we can learn about faith week after week when we come to church? We can read about faith from God's word We can see faith lived out in the faithful people around us, in our faith community. Faith. And yet our faith can still be so shaky. Do you still have no faith, Jesus says to us? And so for the rest of the time this morning, I want to explore three important lessons on faith. You see, like the disciples, God is very much interested in developing our faith. And so he's going to, at times, allow some storms to come into our life. And he does that because he loves us. And so the question we must ask is, will we respond to the storms of life with fear or with solid faith? So let's talk about faith for just a few minutes. Lesson number one, faith depends on its object. Faith depends on its object. The first lesson that we must learn about biblical faith is that faith always depends on an object. You can, ha- let me give you an example. You can have um, very little faith and step onto a, a frozen lake with very thick ice and you'll survive. Or you can have great faith, but if you step onto the thin ice, you're going to break through and likely you're going to drown. You see, it's not the amount of faith It is the object in which you place it. Where is your faith placed? That's why the Bible never says believe. It always says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't say have faith. But it does say have faith in God. Let me illustrate this. You know, in many instances, duct tape is reliable. It's useful for all kinds of great things. I love duct tape. But as a means of water transportation, this duct tape is probably not the best choice. A local news outlet in Alaska shared this story of a man who attempted to cross the Gastineau Channel near Juneau on a homemade watercraft. More specifically, an inflatable duct-taped craft complete with a paddle, his dog, and a conspicuous lack of a life jacket. And so the local news outlet stated that while the weather on scene was reportedly calm with nine mile per hour winds, a local Coast Guard crew was still dispatched to come to the aid of this man when his makeshift boat, patched with duct tape, started to fill with water. Imagine that. And so the Coast Guard, having deemed the craft unsafe, transferred it and the man and his dog to nearby Douglas Harbor. And uh, perhaps to guard against embarrassment, the news release did not identify the man. But what could we say about him? He had great faith. But his faith 
was in duct tape. And so, what in your life do you rely on to provide you with what you need? What do you rely on for health and happiness, for success, for meaning? What is your duct tape? See, when that man got in that boat, it wasn't really faith. It was foolishness. Because the object of his faith was worthless. And folks, we too can be so foolish when we place our faith in the things of this world. What becomes our duct tape? For many of us, our duct tape is our self. I can do it. I will do it. Me, I'm the duct tape. Sometimes our duct tape is other people. Oh, they'll fix it for me. They're the ones that will take care of it. But guess what? People inevitably disappoint us. For some of us, our faith is in the government or in a political party or in a movement. For some of us, our faith is in things or objects or finances or whatever it might be. The list could go on. What is your duct tape? You see, if our faith is not in Jesus Christ alone, then we might as well be sailing along in our boat, patching the holes with duct tape. Who was it in our Bible story who said, let's go to the other side? It was Jesus. Jesus had a plan. Guys, let's go to the other side. And that's why when they see him calm the storm, the disciples can say, who is this? Who is this? Because they not only heard what he said, but now they saw it. They saw what he did. They saw the miracles. They saw his works. And Jesus' works always authenticate his word. And so what he said and what he did were thoroughly compatible and by the way, that is why we must get to know him. The more we get to know Jesus, the person, the more our faith begins to grow, to move from a shaky faith to a solid faith. That's because it is placed in a worthy object. Faith depends on its object. Lesson number two, faith is a process. Faith is a process. What if I told you God is not simply interested in solving your problems? Because, you know, sadly, that's how a lot of us treat God. He's like our magic genie, and we rub the, the, the lamp and ask for our three wishes. God, help me. God, fix this. God, do this. We think God is interested in just being there to fix stuff for us. But the truth is, God is interested in a lot more than fixing stuff. He is interested in developing your character. And he knows exactly how to do that. You know, I find that, that for many Christians, their faith is focused on two things. They know the cross, and they know the coming of Jesus. They know that in the past, Jesus died for me. That is awesome. And they know in the future that he's coming again and that I'm going to be in heaven with him. That is awesome. Those are both important truths. But what about the in-between? Why were we left here? Our salvation has three tenses to it. There is, there is a past. We were saved from the penalty of sins, and that did happen at the cross when Jesus made that sacrifice for us. And we will be saved from the ongoing presence of sin, and that is going to happen when Jesus comes again or when we go to be with him. 
But there is this third dimension in between. Not only the past, not only the future, but the present. We are being saved from the power of sin. And if that is true, and it is, then we must ask ourselves, how am I doing? What progress am I making in this process of faith between the cross and the end? Did you know that once trees reach a certain height, they just stop growing? Well, I should say they stop getting taller, but they don't stop growing. Tree growth rate increases continuously as trees get bigger and bigger. Scientists around the world have studied this, and here's their conclusion. While trees do stop getting taller, they continue to get wider, packing on more and more mass the older they get. And I should say that this is not like an old guy, aging guy getting a, a beer belly, okay? This is old trees that are growing stronger, more active. One researcher put it this way. It's as as if on your favorite sports team, you find out that the star players are a bunch of 90-year-olds. They're the most active. They're the ones scoring the most points. That's an important thing to know. Well, what I want you to see here is a spiritual analogy, all right? Our faith is a journey a process of growth. But do we ever ask ourselves? Do you ever ask yourself as you're growing, how am I doing? How are things going in this growth process? I mean, how long have you known Jesus? If I were to ask you that, you, you might say, well, I, I've known him for like a year or five years or 20 years or 50 years. That's great. What if I ask you, how much have you grown? Tell me, tell me about your growth. Tell me about the process. Do you see what's happening here? God is in a process with each one of us. And that process by design is to be transformational. His goal is to conform us into the image of his son. The Lord wants us to keep growing. And so what are we doing to join him in that process? Faith depends on an object. Faith is a process. And then lesson number three, faith. Faith has some problems. God allows storms into our lives. Because, let's face it, we don't develop our faith in the calm. We develop faith when we go through crises. We develop our faith when we have no other way to look but up to the only worthy object of our faith. So that's why lesson number three here is biblical faith has problems. We have to learn very early in our faith journey that a Christian is not a person without problems. And I know that there's some false teaching out there and false assumptions that that, that cause God's people sometimes to believe that they shouldn't have any problems. That is, let me just say this, that, that is a lie. That's a lie from Satan. We will have problems, Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. And so as soon as we come to understand that, the sooner the better. A Christian is a person who has the problem solver living within them. We have problems, but we know the problem solver. I am confident that if you were to look through the entire Bible, you will not find a verse that promises you any exemption from problems, from troubles. What you will find are a multitude of passages that talk about help that comes in the midst of problems. Absolutely, but not exemption. There is no growth without tension. And so I want to just say this to you this morning. It is not unique to you that you have difficulties in your life. Sometimes we feel that way. 
We feel like we're the only one. You are not the only one who has trouble in your marriage. You are not the only one that has a hard time controlling your temper. You are not the only Christian in this room who struggles with depression or anxiety or lust or addiction. You are not the only one. In fact, these are common to all people. The Apostle Paul writes it this way in 1 Corinthians 10 in verse 13 when he says, No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And then comes the best word in the whole verse. But. But. Usually when you see that word but, something good is coming. But, Paul says, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tested above what you are able, but who will with the testing provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so the ultimate test of our faith is, are we going to hold up or are we going to fold up? What do you see? You got problems with your kids. You got problems at work. You got problems in your marriage. You wonder how long it's going to last. The ultimate issue is not whether you have problems, but whether you know anyone who can do anything about them. Folks, if Jesus is in our boat, we know somebody who can do something about the problem we're enduring, about the storm we're in the middle of, about the waves that are breaking over the side of the boat and filling the boat, and we feel like we're sinking fast. We say, Jesus, don't you care that I'm perishing? And he says, have some faith. Don't you have some faith? Where is your focus? And so here's the conclusion. Here's what I want you to take home today. If nothing else, I want you to memorize this statement. The storm will not last forever. In fact, say it with me. The storm will not last forever. Let's say it again. The storm will not last forever. Hold on to that truth brothers and sisters. If Jesus Christ is in your boat, it will never sink. The storm will not last forever. There is only one worthy object for our faith, and his name is Jesus Christ. And the more that you know him, the more that you're going to cry out like the disciples did, who is this? That even the waves and the winds obey him. That's not a statement of wondering. It's a statement of wonder. Who is this man in my boat? He's in your boat. And he's in my boat if we invite him in. Many years ago, Sue and I got into trouble with the Internal Revenue Service. One day, just out of the blue, we received an, a letter. One of those thin letters from the IRS that kind of scare you. And we opened that letter, and in summation it said, you owe thousands of dollars to us. You need to pay it. Well, fortunately there was a phone number to call. And so we called that number. And I eventually got through to the man who was in charge of our particular case, and the nicest thing that I can say about him is he was one mean dude. <laughs> and I explained my situation, and I explained what I thought was the problem, and he said, you owe the money. When can we expect to receive it? I said, I don't think I owe the money. You owe the money. He said, send me your paperwork. All right, so I sent him the paperwork. And then we didn't hear anything for weeks and weeks. Finally, we got another letter. Oh, we opened that letter, and it says, you owe the money. <laughs> and not only do you owe the money, but you owe interest and penalties on top of the money. And it's now thousands and thousands. It might as well have been millions of dollars. We had no money. 
We had three young daughters. We had nothing else. No bank account, no savings. We lived from check to check. We had nothing. Called the guy again. You owe the money. He sent me a final letter demanding the money, saying, I'm going to garnish your wages if you don't pay the money. But on that letter, at the bottom, there was a little thing that said, you can appeal this decision. And you know I appeal that decision. <laughs> yes, I appeal that decision. Long story short, we went through the process. We sent paperwork again. More copies, the same stuff we'd already sent. We sent it again. More letters, back and forth. And after weeks and weeks and weeks, finally we got a letter that said, you have an appointment with a hearings official in downtown Portland at the federal building. Come at this day and at this time, bring your attorney and bring your documents. Well, I'd already sent him the documents and I didn't have any money for an attorney. So on the day and the time, my wife and I showed up. Had my tie on. My wife dressed up. We checked in at the front desk. They ushered us back to a room, said, wait here. Somebody will be with you. It's a small room, a table, four or five chairs, nothing on the walls. Just Sue and I in our boat with the water rising around us, the waves crashing over us. We felt like we were perishing. We didn't know what to do. But we knew Jesus. We prayed. And then the door opened. Two women walked in the door. The first one introduced herself, said, I'm the hearings official. This other lady is here as a stenographer. She's going to take records of this meeting. Let's get started. And she sat down. She opened her file. She shuffled through her papers for a moment. Not more than 30 seconds. Then she looked up and she said, Mr. and Mrs. Carney, your case is dismissed. She said, I'm sorry if this has caused you any anxiety. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. And she walked out the door. The meeting didn't last more than two minutes. You're going to discover that God is very much interested in developing your faith. And part of that developing process is that he's going to allow some storms to come along to teach us a thing or two. Because, you know, he is the perfect educator. He knows just the curriculum to make you like Jesus Christ. And he's going to allow some storms into your life because he loves you. Folks, our Heavenly Father loves us so much. And He not only accepts us as we are, but He doesn't stop there. He loves us so much that He doesn't want us to remain the way we are. And so He has a plan to conform you, to transform you, to build you, to be the man or the woman that he wants you to be in the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And so the question we must ask is, will we respond to our storms with fear or with faith? A faith that is anchored on the solid rock that will not move.